Good evening. Um, first order of business, can you hear me okay at the back? And, and the front, every second. Um, so thank you. It's lovely to see a large, a large crowd here tonight for what I know will be a lovely and interesting talk. Um, my name is Joe Houlihan. I run the military history group here at the uh, Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. We have uh, usually a talk every month, and we have some really interesting speakers coming up this year, um, at least one of whom is in the room, in addition to tonight's speaker. Um, so if you want to be added to a list to find out more about uh, military history talks, please feel free to see me afterwards or just give me a, a note with your email address on it, and I'll add you to my email list, which uh, I won't bombard you with things, but roughly once a month you'll get a note about an upcoming talk. Um, okay, uh, Nelson and Bath, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the fact that uh, Nelson, one of Britain's greatest military heroes, um, had, a, had a very strong connection with Bath. Um, and many of you may have come to the event we held last year with the Nelson Society uh, on, the, on the anniversary of the Battle of Copenhagen in early April, where we had some excellent speakers and some really interesting talks about Nelson's Bath and a wonderful guided walk by one of the mayor's guides, Clive Johnson, who's with us tonight. Um, tonight, Chris Brett, chair of the Nelson, chairman of the Nelson Society, will be talking about Nelson and the slave trade. I don't want to steal his thunder, but again, I'm sure many of you will be aware that, that stories have circulated in recent years suggesting that Nelson was um, passionately in favour of the slave trade. That's at least one direct quote I read on a on a history website. Um, Chris has taken this issue on, on board, investigated it thoroughly, and actually <laughs> produced a book with some really quite startling and interesting results when he looked into where these stories came from, that, that uh, Nelson was a, a supporter of the slave trade. And I think he um, uh, really opened a can of worms and, and got to the bottom of it. And I think Tonight's talk will be very interesting. Um, just on the Nelson and Bath connection, uh, Clive from the Mayor's Guides has also asked me to mention that um, there will be uh, a series of special Nelson guided walks starting in April, uh, two in April and two in May. Uh, the title of the walks is I See No Ships. And I can imagine all the, uh, the Nelson Society members kind of fidgeting nervously because they know that, that actually that's not the quote. The quote was not, I see no ships. He actually put the telescope to his blind eye and said, I see no signals so he could proceed with battle. Um, but commonly it's known as I, I see no ships. So I see no ships, Nelson and Bath. These talks will be in April and May. Uh, please do have a look on the, the Brilsey website moving forward when more information will be forthcoming. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Chris Brett, Chairman of the Nelson Society. Well, that's a good sign, getting some applause before you start. Um, I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Um, whenever I do an event like this, the, the society always likes a report. So whilst you're all still here, not leaving halfway through my talk, could you just all smile? <laughs> Great, that's lovely, thank you. Um, right, as, as you can see, my name is Chris Brett. I'm chairman of the Nelson Society. And in my talk this evening, I want to cover sort of three areas. I'll tell you a little bit about the society, which is actually relevant to the first two areas I want to cover. Um, the first area is an examination as to whether Nelson was pro the slave trade. Mm -hmm. And the second is to look at a conspiracy to really um, involve Nelson in debates in Parliament after his death about the abolition of the slave trade. And then finally, I, you might think, well, what does all this matter uh, today? But uh, uh, as we will see, it does. And I'll, I'll take you through why I think it's relevant. So the Nelson Society. Um, we're a registered charity and our object is to raise public awareness of the life and times of Admiral Lord Nelson and his Navy. And we achieve this through doing a number of things, supporting research, supporting conservation, projects, sponsoring publications, amongst other things. And of course, we have a very good relationship with you in Bath. We were involved with UNESCO in producing the Nelson and Bath Trail. And I believe if you haven't got the leaflet of the Bath Trail, there are some available, available here. 
Now, for some 40 years or over 40 years, we've been going along in our own quiet little way, doing this researching and publishing and so on. Um, and we've pursued those interests quite, quite quietly and calmly. Um, but latterly, another issue has raised its head. And that is that we have to defend Nelson's reputation in the wake of allegations about his character and his behavior, in particular, defending him from allegations that he was pro-slavery and pro the slave trade. And this is where he's been caught up in the current debate about the reassessment of our historical figures. So this is a, an image that appeared about four or five years ago. Um, it, it was produced by, of all people, Historic England, protectors of our heritage. And there they were suggesting that, you know, Nelson, Nelson's column might be taken down, destroyed because of his uh, alleged links with the slave trade. I regard this as Nelson's final battle. It's the battle for his reputation. I'd like to think it was this, Trafalgar, but unfortunately, uh, it is the battle for his reputation. So, first part of my talk, how did this all start? Well, it started with an article in The Guardian by the journalist Afua Hirsch in August 2017. Now, in that article, she accused Nelson, I'm going to quote this if you don't mind, of being a white supremacist who used his seat in the House of Lords and his position of huge influence to perpetuate the tyranny, serial rape, and exploitation organized by West Indian planters, some of whom he counted amongst his closest friends. Okay, so, um, now, I don't know what you think, but I think those are pretty serious allegations to be leveled against anyone in any age. And I think for that reason alone, um, they deserve detailed investigation. And even more so when they're accepted at face value in the current debate. Right, so let's have a look at the evidence. On the issue of white supremacy, I've done a great deal of reading and research, read hundreds of books on Nelson, read many of his letters, most of his letters, and I can find no pronouncements by him um, that he felt people of different races or ethnicities uh, were inferior. Uh, but hopefully that will become clearer as we go along. Let's look at the contention that he used his seat in the House of Lords to perpetuate the horrors of the slave trade. And let's not be under any illusions, the slave trade was horrific. Nelson was created a peer, Baron Nelson of the Nile and Burnham Thorpe, in November 1798, following his victory at the Battle of the Nile. After his victory at the Battle of Copenhagen in 1801, he was ele elevated to Viscount Nelson of the Nile and Burnham Thorpe, and this allowed him to take his seat in the House of Lords. Now, this is interesting. This is a matter of public record. We know when he appeared and we know what he said. He appeared six times between October 1801 and December 1802. The speeches he made were largely on naval matters, and not once did he refer to the issue of slavery or the slave trade. Apparently, he wasn't actually a very good speaker. Now, I come from Norfolk like Nelson, so I know that feeling. So you'll have to bear with me for the rest of this evening. Um, his close friend and colleague, Captain Hardy, who you will know about, said, on hearing that Nelson had spoken in the House of Lords, I'm very sorry for it, and I'm fully convinced that sailors should not talk too much. <laughs> so, ringing endorsement for Nelson there from one of his best friends. So, there's no evidence that Nelson used his position in the House of Lords to perpetuate the horrors of which he was accused uh, of by a few of Hirsch. But, of course, he could have used his title outside the Lords. Um, and I think that's what a few of Hirsch is referring to when she said he used his huge influence. So, excuse me, let's look at that. I would argue that potentially the period of Nelson's greatest influence was between 1797 and 1805. That's really when he came to the public fore. Um, during that time, he was totally obsessed, totally obsessed with defeating the French. 
that guy, um, and their allies. And of course, there was someone else who occupied quite a lot of his time, and that was Emma Hamilton. But again, there's no evidence that he turned his mind to the slave trade, except perhaps obliquely. And that was when he was in charge of the Mediterranean fleet during that period. Here, um, he was losing supplies and men to the Barbary slave trade. And he was so frustrated that time was being spent in London debating what to do about the West Indian slave trade that he was getting, well, I think saying getting quite cross is probably an understatement um, because this was affecting his theatre of operations. And he wrote in strong terms to the Admiralty saying, please let me deal with this. And I think if I tell you that his solution would have been gunboat diplomacy, you might know what I mean. But there is one example in this period where Nelson used his influence on the issue of slavery and slaves. And that was to secure the release of 24 Turkish slaves who were being held on a Portuguese man of war. That was off Sicily. And the story is excellently covered in one of my colleagues book, uh, Martin Downer's book, Nelson's Lost Jewel. I'm sorry about the photograph, but it's very difficult to, yeah, anyway, we'll forget that. Um, but yes, I re really recommend uh, this book if you're interested in uh, in, in Nelson. This deals with the, the Shalink, that's the jewel that you can see there, which was given to him by the Sultan of Turkey. Um, but Martin does describe how Nelson secured the release of these slaves. Um, in essence, Nelson wrote to the captain of the ship that was holding the slaves, and begged for their release as a favour to himself and a favour to his country. So in that instance, Nelson used his influence to secure the release of slaves. Uh, in reality, and beyond his naval affairs, Nelson had very little influence. We tend to think of him as being, you know, the epitome of the great... British hero who could do anything he wanted and everyone would do what he wanted. Well, that wasn't the case. The truth was that Nelson had very limited influence in other spheres of his life. For example, he couldn't persuade the Admiralty to give a victory medal to those who fought with him at Copenhagen. And nor could he persuade the government to give Emma a pension as a reward for the services uh, in supporting the British fleet um, prior to the Battle of the Nile. Uh, he had no influence at all with the king, who frowned on his affair with Emma. Now, Nelson was so disillusioned, if you like, by this lack of influence, that when he set up home with Emma in 1800 at Merton, he said to her, none but real friends shall visit us. None of the great shall enter our peaceful abode. So the, the influence that Nelson could exercise was, in reality, extremely limited. Now, given that there's no evidence that uh, Nelson used his position in the House of Lords or his huge influence to perpetuate the slave trade, we might think it a bit of a moot point as to whether he had any friends amongst the West Indian planters, as a few of hers uh, alleged. But I'd quite like to have a look at that proposition. We know that Nelson visited the West Indies four times, five if you count the chase of the French fleet there in June 1805, which I'll come to in a moment. Nelson joined the Navy at the age of 12 in 1770 under the patronage of his uncle, Captain Morris Suckling. In 1771, Captain Suckling managed a little bit of subterfuge and was able to get Nelson on a merchant ship sailing to the West Indies, basically, basically to give Nelson experience at sea. Nelson was retained on the Navy's book, so it was a little bit of a, uh, a subterfuge but it was intended to keep Nelson's continuity of service. The ship he went on, the Mary Ann, used to carry uh, uh, slave-produced goods. But as far as we know, no slaves were transported by that ship. Given his age, he was only 12, he hadn't been in the Navy long, it's quite unlikely that Nelson made any acquaintances in the West Indies. Uh, this, the, the ship was traveling from island to island. He wouldn't have had time to make any lasting friendships. And given his age and his status, again, unlikely that he was exposed to uh, the great and the good of those, uh, those islands. Nelson, in his autobiography, he, he wrote a short autobiography, I think in 
about 1799, just telling everybody, if you try hard and work hard like me, you can be great as well. Um, but basically, he noted in his autobiography that uh, he returned from that trip a practical seaman, but he had a horror of the Royal Navy. But he made no reference to slaves or slavery at all. His first naval tour of duty was between 1777 and 1780. He was stationed in Jamaica, and here he took command of Fort Charles in Port Royal, and he spent a lot of time in the officer's accommodation, although again, almost certainly he would have met with some of the planter class on the island. But I think there's one very telling fact about this tour, which helps in, in our picture of Nelson. He met his closest friend from that time uh, in the West Indies, Hercules Ross. Now, Ross was a, a trader and a naval prize agent. He had a slave mistress whom he freed when he returned to Scotland in 1782. But here's the thing. Ross entered into correspondence with Wilberforce on his return and gave evidence to the Parliamentary Commission into the slave trade in 1790. And I would say as an aside, Wilberforce was heavily criticised for agreeing to allow that commission to, to happen, um, as it would delay the process of abolition. Ross became a staunch abolitionist, and he and Nelson had a very long and enduring relationship. Nelson stood as godfather to Ross's son, who was named Horatio. So I don't think that such a strong relationship could have formed and lasted so long if the two had held polar opposite views on slavery. One other quick footnote, perhaps, on that tour, Nelson fought alongside free black fighters and Native Americans in the ill-fated campaign to try and capture Fort Juan uh, in <laughs> San Juan in Nicaragua. He clearly valued them as fellow warriors, and they professed themselves, and I quote, very fond of Captain Nelson. Uh, but on this campaign, he was struck down by a fever and he was nursed back to some sort of health by a free black woman, Cooper Cornwallis, with whom or for whom he held lasting affection. And it was probably on this tour that Nelson met an influential Jamaican planter called Simon Taylor. He's going to feature heavily in the second part of our consideration of this issue. Now, Nelson undertook two more tours of duty. The first was in 1782-83, where in fact he, he met and befriended Prince William Henry, the future King William IV. Um, I would say much of this tour was spent at sea. Nelson was itching to fight the French, but unfortunately no battle uh, occurred. His final tour was 1784-87. Now, I think this is a very telling event in our story. Nelson was stationed in Antigua. You're gonna see some of my holiday photographs. <laughs> um, he arrived in August and spent the first three months on board ship in English Harbor. This is English Harbor. It was hurricane season. Now Nelson described Antigua. So well, I'll describe Antigua. I think it's a great place. I love going there for holiday. But Nelson called it an infernal hellhole. It was strategically important due to its harbour. And I would say, incidentally, that this is Nelson's dockyard. He was only there for three years. It, it celebrates its 300th anniversary next year. And of those three years, they decided to name the dockyard after him. Um, so fantastic marketing, but quite correct. But this is, no, this is Nelson's dockyard, 300 years old next year. Um, but it was whilst on this station that Nelson ran into conflict uh, with the with the Islanders. He and the Collingwood brothers, you'll remember Cuthbert Collingwood was his number two at Trafalgar, um, rigorously enforced the navigation acts, which, which required British merchandise to be carried in British ships. Now the islands, the islanders had had close ties with the, American, uh, with the Americans, but since American independence, British goods carried on American ships was in breach of the act. So trade between the islands and America uh, suffered, and Nelson was ostracised by island society. He complained that he was persecuted so much that he couldn't leave his ship, that he was not popular with the people, 
And whilst his body was with them, his heart and mind were elsewhere. He went so far as to say that he would hold the inhabitants of Antigua very cheap in future, but I will have done with such trash. Now, I think that's pretty harsh, but uh, um, it was hardly a ringing endorsement of his relationship with the West Indian planters. Just another one of my holiday slides. Um, I think one quick thing we should mention, though, Nelson did, of course, fall in love with the niece of a planter, Frances Fanny Nisbet. But in short, they didn't benefit financially from that relationship. And after their marriage, they returned to England, where Nelson, um, I think, pursued his Navy career with full vigour. They showed no desire to become part of planter society and all, you know, to in all, all intents and purposes turned their back on it. So I think it's fair to say that the allegations made by Theo Hirsch bear very little weight in evidential terms, although we will see how they insidiously affect uh, public opinion as we go on. Um, I'm going to look next at the conspiracy to pull Nelson into the, de the debates at the time on the abolition of the slave trade. One of the benefits of history, of course, is that we can look back and put things in order a situation which wasn't always apparent to those people living those moments. Um, and, and they might even not be aware of what was happening at the time. So I will set out the sequence of events and then we'll see how things become confused. But before that, and this is an experiment today, <laughs> I'm gonna go slightly off piste. I think it's important that we understand the context in which these events were unfolding. And I think we have a, uh, a descendant of the first uh, Viscount Melville, Henry Dundas, here with us tonight. And I think some of uh, uh, the other descendants may be uh, watching on online. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Henry Dundas. And that's because it helps us understand the context within which these things were happening and what Nelson was, was facing. OK, now the period we're talking about was highly nuanced. So, for example, slave owners often had slave mistresses by whom they had uh, offspring and they, they were very happy to look after them. Uh, the scene at home was no less complicated. By way of example, we'll have a look at Henry Dundas, who was a member of Pitt's government from 1791 to 1805. And he held a number of very senior post, First Lord of the Admiralty, the Home Secretary, etc. And he was a very influential member of the government. In 1792, William Wilberforce sponsored a motion in the House of Commons that the slave trade carried on by British subjects um, should be abolished. Now, he'd introduced a similar motion the year before, which had been resoundingly defeated. Dundas tabled a petition um, from Edinburgh residents who supported the, the motion. And he went on to affirm his agreement in principle with William Wilberforce's motion. And he said, my opinion has always been against the slave trade. He argued, however, that an immediate vote would be ineffective. And you can see why it had been resoundingly beaten the year before. Why, why would Parliament treat it any differently now? So he introduced a phrase that he introduced the word gradual into the motion, which was going to allow the abolition of the slave trade over a period of time. That amendment was adopted by Parliament. And for the first time, for the first time, the House of Commons voted to end the slave trade. A few weeks after the, the vote, Dundas tabled resolution setting out a plan for implementing abolition uh, by the end of 1799. So an eight-year an eight period, seven-year period between the uh, vote to abolish um, the slave trade and its final implementation. Unfortunately, despite a number of proposals, they weren't adopted. Um, and the motion and resolution sort of failed in Parliament. And the support of the House of Lords wasn't forthcoming. And so the whole issue was deferred. And the problem, of course, is that we're still in these horrible wars with France, which started to take priority. 
interestingly, some scholars have uh, thought that the amendment introduced by Dundas was with the uh, connivance of William Pitt, the Prime Minister. Um, the idea was that Dundas would produce this uh, resolution and then Pitt would be free to talk vehemently in favour without any limitations on the abolition of slavery. Between 1792 and 1807, when the slave trade was finally abolished, uh, it's estimated that another half a million Africans were, were trans transported into slavery. Um, there's been a great debate in academic circles as to Dundas's role here. Um, someone has called him, I think, the great delayer of the slave trade. Others have realized that he was taking a very practical position. How on earth was he going to get a motion through Parliament that he knew um, had been heavily defeated the year before. He knew that um, uh, the king himself, royalty, was against it. The House of Lords was against it. His was a practical proposition, and it secured the first vote in the House of Parliament for the uh, abolition of slavery. Now, as I said, I raised this issue for a couple of reasons. If politicians were grappling in this sort of swirling sea of considerations, the war, the economy was a feature, opposition, the laws, the royal family, what on earth chance did a, a humble, or in Nelson's case, not so humble, uh, sailor have of grappling with these issues? And I think this point becomes more important as the story unfolds. It also demonstrates uh, retrospectively how easy it is to tarnish reputations. Um, I think the Dundas Monument in Edinburgh has been subject to um, vandalism and uh, by the local council as well as from activists. So um, it shows you how these things can snowball and you can get embroiled in these things. Okay, um, I've been off piste. I'm coming back onto the, uh, the main track now. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, that Nelson started to set up home with Emma. Um, and by the way, I'm going to try and take you through the, the process as things happened. Uh, he set up home with Emma in 1800. And one of his visitors, regular visitors, was one of his protégés called Lieutenant Lehman. Now, Lehman was an ideas man. In fact, I think he used to annoy the Admiralty by writing to them regularly with, I've got an idea about how we can make ships cheaper, how we can do this, da da da. But one of these ideas, was to replace slave labor with Chinese labor, paid Chinese labor. He thought the Chinese are most industrious people. And he wrote to the colonial office accordingly. Now his plan was quite detailed and he, was, he sent it off to the colonial office. He was interviewed and they discussed it. They were taking it forward. Uh, events didn't quite turn out and the colonial office was, was closed, but there was an ill-fated attempt to try and implement a similar plan uh, to Layman's. Now, Layman was at sea. He came back from sea and discovered after Nelson's death that this plan had been, uh, a plan similar to his, been put into action and had failed. So he decided to publish his plan. Now, I don't know if you can see, it's not very clear, but the date at the bottom is 1807. So this is after Nelson has died. So where does Nelson fit in? Well, in replying to uh, Lehman in relation to the plan, Nicholas Van Sittart, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, said, I was introduced uh, to you by Mr. Wilson, and I believe by a letter from Lord Nelson. Now, this reply came in the context of Lehman, Lehman asking Van Sittart to say, it was my plan. So Nelson was clearly aware of Lehman's plan. He, he must have been impressed by it to introduce a junior officer to uh, senior members of the government. And I think this is strong circumstantial evidence that Nelson supported Lehman's plan and thought it worthy uh, of support. Okay, let's roll forward now to June 1805. Now, Nelson is on board Victory, and he's pursuing the French fleet across the Atlantic, trying to bring that fleet to battle. Now, um, excuse me, let's get it. So, Nelson starts, arrives in Barbados, Tobago, 
5th of June, 8th of June, and starts moving up the coast following the French fleet. And a famous letter is written, would we'll come to in a moment, of Martinique. Can I just draw your attention to the fact that Jamaica is over here? That will become an important fact in what happens subsequently. But this is Nelson's pursuit of the, the French fleet, trying to bring them to battle. As I said, off June the 10th, he's off Martinique, and he writes to Simon Taylor, that influential uh, and rich planter on Jamaica. In that letter, he states the, about the action he's taken in pursuing the French fleet, fleet, and you can see what's happening. Now, crucially, he goes on to say, and I, I will just again quote this, and if you all have a sharp intake of breath, I'll fully understand. He says, I have ever been and shall die a firm friend of our present colonial system. I was bred in the good old school and taught to appreciate the value of our West India possessions and neither in the field or the Senate shall their just rights be infringed whilst I have an arm to fight in their defence or a tongue to launch my voice against the damnable cruel doctrine of Wilberforce and his hypocritical allies. Oh, I, I, I've been here, wow. You know, I think that seems quite damning on the face of it, but it is strangely at odds with what we know and believe about Nelson. So that letter is obviously worthy of examination in detail. Experts say that Nelson was nothing but a wordsmith and everything he wrote was carefully crafted. And of course, when you think that he was writing letters to the Admiralty about battle tactics and so on, he had to be absolutely clear and precise. So I, I have a lot of belief in that in that uh, assertion that uh, Nelson was uh, a very a very careful um, letter writer. Now this letter also falls into something which we can call a private category. It was to a, an acquaintance. This wouldn't appear in the Admiralty papers. This was not for public consumption. So let's just have a look at some of those, those words. He talks about the present colonial system. And I think when you look at what was going on in the country at the time, neither Wilberforce nor Dundas nor Pitt wanted the colonial system dismantled. What they were looking for was to end the slave trade. So Nelson's statement that um, he supports the present colonial system doesn't mean that he was supporting slavery. He was reflecting what I think was a, a political imperative of the time. He was also taught about the value of our West Indian possessions. Now, anybody at the time knew that the West Indies were providing a great deal of wealth. And that economic contribution was absolutely vital to the war against France. So again, Nelson is not saying anything controversial when he says he knows the value of the West, Indi West Indian possessions. And then I think he becomes quite careful in some of his other wording. He talks about the just rights of those islands. Now those rights are prescribed by parliament. And as I've explained with the Navigation Acts, Nelson was nothing but a follower of the laws of the day. And I think that he was being very clever by saying, they're just rights I will defend. He does say if he had an arm, well, he did have one arm, thank goodness, to, to fight in their defence. Uh, but if those rights changed, then Nelson would change with them, no doubt. Then we come to, the, I think, one of the key phrases. He uses the words the damnable cruel doctrine of Wilberforce and his hypocritical allies. Oh, there he is, there's William Wilberforce. Why did Nelson see Wilberforce's doctrine as damnable cruel? You would think that Nelson, who was to all intents and purposes, very humane, compassionate to his men, you would think that he would think that Wilberforce's doctrine was worthy of support. Now, I think here that Nelson is referring to events that have been taking place in Saint-Domingue, modern-day Haiti, where a vicious slave revolt had taken place and, and was equally viciously repressed by the French, and the war went on for quite a long time. I think that Nelson was concerned that Wilberforce's approach to immediate abolition could lead to similar outcomes in the British colonies, and more importantly, if you think what 
Nelson's obsessions were. More importantly, they would divert resources away from the war effort with France. Mm -hmm. Who could protect the colonies? The only arm of the, the British military that could protect the colonies was the Navy. Mm -hmm. They had to travel across the Atlantic to get there. They were the only people who do that. Nelson would, would be extremely worried about that. Now, why, why did he think, though, that this man was hypocritical? Well, there are lots of um, contemporary um, contemporary evidence about this. I mean, for example, Wil Wilberforce um, didn't support workers' rights in the in the UK, and a number of commentators say, "Well, that's hypocritical. Why are you looking for the freedom of slaves when we've got basically, you know, people in rural conditions who are um, poor, can't look after themselves, and you're support you're not supporting movements to improve their conditions." Um, and you can compare this directly with Nelson. When Nelson was put on what's known as the beach, on the beach, on half pay, at a time of peace with France, they don't last very long, um, he wrote to Prince William Henry and said, look, the rural poor here can't afford to live. They haven't got enough wages. You know, the landowners must pay them more and help them. And Nelson was on half pay and he was helping support some of these families. So he would he would see Wilberforce's lack of action in this area as being hypocritical when compared to what he was proposing for the slave trade. Um, that's it. Now, we'll have a look at this in a moment, but in a postscript to the letter, Nelson raises the issue of one of his friends, his chaplain, Alexander Scott, who had lost his living as a curate on Jamaica larger result of serving with Nelson. In essence, this was an important reason for writing the letter that he did. I think he carefully constructed the first part of the letter um, without, without saying, I support the slave trade or slavery, or I support you in your endeavors to see um, uh, it maintained. Um, at the end of this, he says, by the way, my friend's lost his job. And I think he's saying, would you mind giving, me, giving him a job? We'll have a look at that in a moment. So what happened next was this, Nelson's death at Trafalgar. Now, what's the importance of that? Well, the importance is that it gave the planters the chance to publish Nelson's letter as supporting the slave trade. However, his letter clearly didn't go far enough. So the planters off altered the letter and this is the forged copy. So up here, we have a reused seal, one of Nelson's seal. As we'll see, we have a forged Nelson signature. And this is the paragraph about, gives a job, please. Um, but something else that's interesting, I don't know how clear that is, but here is a little aster asterisk. And down here, it says, killed at the Battle of Trafalgar, um, October the 21st, 1805. Now that actually becomes quite important when we try and understand what was going on. So what are the key reasons we know that this is a forgery? Apart from obvious clues like the handwriting. But this note at the bottom, which says that Scott was killed at Trafalgar, um, is actually a mistake. News of Trafalgar reached Jamaica in late 1805, which is when this letter was written. And before the news in January 1806, that it was the other Scott who was killed. And this refers to Alexander Scott, Nelson's uh, chaplain. The Scott who was killed at Trafalgar was Nelson's secretary, John Scott. So we can tell that this letter was clearly written when the news of the battle had arrived. Um, there was this footnote that Scott had been killed, but it was the wrong Scott. So clearly people hadn't got their information information right. <laughs> By the time that they realised that they got the wrong Scott, this letter was on its way to London and was probably appearing in the coffee shops and, and circulating to influence people. Next, the second version of the letter was also doing the rounds. Again, different handwriting. Now, this letter was written in 1806 and is very similar in its content to the letter that we've just looked at. Now, what I'd just like to, if I can, is perhaps just point 
this to you. Can you see this? And can you see that that looks like 908 or if you turn it upside down, 806? Now that is the confirmation that this letter was written in 1806. We had to do quite a lot of research with the post office and uh, and there is, a, there is a group called the British Postmark Society, um, uh, which was very helpful because they, they confirmed that this stamp with the 806 followed the convention of uh, dating. Instead of 1806, you took the one away and it was 806. So we now know that this letter was definitely written uh, in, in 1806. There are some very strange marks here. These pencil marks. One says this was written by Nelson's secretary. Well, that clearly couldn't be the case because you know that he was he was dead at this time. Um, and the other suggested that this had been passed to um, a high ranking member of the government to, to consider. Now, those are later pencil marks. Um, um, I don't know when they were written, but uh, uh, they clearly suggest that these letters were, were doing the round. So we now have two versions of Nelson's letter. Now, I think it's worth noting that these letters, as we'll see, um, I call them forgeries in the sense that they were not true copies. Um, they were forged after Nelson's death and introduced terms that ramped up the pressure on the government, for example, implying that the empire was at risk, replacing just rights with the term interest. We'll have a look at that in a moment. But most importantly, they, they replaced the term damnable cruel doctrine, which I'll try to explain, with the words damnable cursed doctrine. Um, that was quite vicious. The, the, the word cursed is something that applies to the uh, abolitionist movement by the planters throughout this, 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 the run up to the abolition debates. The letter, as we'll see at the bottom here, sorry, we'll just go back if I may. I'm not sure that it, it, oh, it does say here, it says that Jamaica is safe. Now that never appeared in Nelson's original letter. And do you remember the map I showed you that Jamaica was a thousand miles away from where Nelson was going? Why would he say Jamaica is safe? He knew that he was nowhere near Jamaica. So again, this gives us a clue that um, the Jamaican uh, planters were really trying to put pressure on the government. Um, perhaps I can just give you a, a little bit of background on Nelson's letters. There's no doubt that Nelson's fame in his lifetime led to many of his letters being kept. And as well as those official letters that he wrote to the Admiralty, which are stored there, um, he, his letters were referred to by his earliest biographers, such as Clark and MacArthur. Sorry, forgive me. Yeah, so Clark and MacArthur, um, as you can see halfway down, it says from his Lordship's manuscripts. Uh, let's, Joe, how do I go back on the slide? Forgive me, I just need to go back a, a slide or two. Um, but the earliest collections were this one, Clark and MacArthur, and uh, the one by Sir Nicholas Harris, Harris Nicholas. So it's a pressing return to go forward. I mean, yeah, yeah. I wonder if just the... Uh, Forgive me. Yeah, sorry about this. I don't want to do something that will lose the... Uh, Oh, the display. So, oh, this one. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Oh, right. Is that back number four? Yeah, my apologies. Okay. Right, that's nice just... Ah, I've really gone back now. Right. You'll have to bear with me. This is a quick recap of where we've got to so far. <laughs> right, here we are. Oh, right, well, we can have just do a quick... Okay, so you remember the map, the, the difference. Why, why would, why would Nelson even write in a letter that Jamaica is safe? It was never under any sort of threat. <clears throat> right. So those are those are the forgeries. Um, the forgeries were reproduced in William Cobbett's Political Register in eighteen o seven, a month before the debates in Parliament, and this is the version of the letter. Uh, it from Cobbett's political register. But again, um, you might just be able to make out, I'm not sure how clearly, clearly that comes up, but here, Jamaica is safe. Yeah, that never appeared in Nelson's original letter. Right, so back, back to the script. 
Um, Nelson's foremost biographers were um, the Nicholas edition, seven volumes of those, probably about five or 6,000 letters. The manuscripts relied on by um, Clark and MacArthur. Um, the problem with these letters is that they didn't always reflect the original manuscript. They were edited for some form of convention. The authors took things out that they didn't think were important. So it's very difficult to know what was in the original letters. But Nelson had a system of making copies of his own letters, particularly those that were private, not the ones that went to the Admiralty, but ones that he wanted to keep. Now, there is a collection of letters in the British Library known as the Bridport Collection. They're copies of original letters and they are obtained by a specially designed machine. And what that did, it, the, the author or the secretary would press damp tissue paper on the original letter, um, giving a mirror image. This was then reversed and stuck onto light gray paper so that the text could be clearly read. An early form of photocopying, brilliant idea, 1805, fantastic. Um, and the letters in this collection, are, as I've said, are largely of a private or personal nature. Some of them were concerned with um, diplomatic or intelligence matters, but there is a, this book is really worth reading. It's got a lot of unpublished material, um, previously unpublished material, and it's all come from the Bridport collection. Right, so that was how things happened in real time. We've gone through from Nelson uh, meeting uh, layman in 1800 right through to the political register in 1807. But how did we discover that this was a conspiracy? Now, things started again after a few Hirsch's article with an article being published by Professor Krista Petley of Southampton University in the BBC History magazine called Nelson's Dark Side. Now, in that article, he referred to a letter written by Nelson to Simon Taylor, and Krista Petley is an expert on uh, Simon Taylor. And the version he, that he referred to was the letter that was in Cobbett's political register. And as I've said, that was based on the tampered versions of Nelson's letter. Uh, but in 2018, that wasn't widely known, although I think the clues were there. Professor Petley drew the conclusion from Cobbett's version of the letter that Nelson supported the slave trade. Uh, although I would say in an article that he published in 2015, he relied on another version of the letter and it never occurred to him to ask or question why there were differences between them. During 2018, Martin Downer, who wrote Nelson's Duel, and he was an expert in Nelson memorabilia, and he's an eminent Nelson author, was sent by one of those sort of amazing coincidences, that first version of the forged letter. And to his trained eye, it clearly wasn't by Nelson, so it was just put aside as a curiosity. Also during 2018, so this is how this story really unfolded for us, uh, and it was entirely unrelated to Martin's discovery, I came across an image of that second letter, the one with the 806 postage stamp. Um, it was in a um, an auction catalogue, and as was my want, I just took a screenshot of it because I used to try and check anything that purported to be Nelson, a uh, Nelson letter. I used to take copies of it and check to see what had been published before, because new letters always add to our knowledge of what Nelson was doing. Um, but it, again, it clearly wasn't by Nelson, so I just sort of filed it under pending without thinking about it. Um, Luckily, and very luckily, I didn't delete it from my phone. Um, the publication of Krista Petley's article, this article, stimulated research by the Nelson Society into allegations of Nelson's supposed racism. And in short, our first investigation were a response to those raised by a few of Hirsch. Um, but this led Martin to reassess that first forged letter. Um, he'd put it aside as a curio, um, and he, he concluded it was, was definitely a forgery um, and published his findings in the national press. The letter's now in the National uh, Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth. Um, I hate to say this, but it triggered something deep in the recesses of my mind. 
I can't pretend that my mind is very deep, but it, I managed to remember that I'd also taken a, a, a screenshot of something similar. I pulled up the letter and the similarities with the early one were quite, were quite startling. And for reasons I've explained, that first forgery was written in early January 1806. Um, and it was clear that this was a later version of that letter. The second was a later version of it. The trouble is, frustratingly, we couldn't find the original letter. We had lots of versions of it in print, and we had the two forgeries, but until we could compare those with the uh, original, uh, we had no idea about the degree of, of, of forgery. We then found an oblique reference to the letter in uh, John Sugden's uh, wonderful biography of Nelson. And we discovered, of, of course, that it was in the British, British Library, in the press letter collection. Um, but as is, as is uh, always the way, we couldn't access it because of COVID. Anyway, when we eventually got to uh, the British Library, this is what we found. This, these are two pages of the pressed letter. Now, I know you can't read that very clearly, um, but I think it's pretty clear that the type of handwriting here is significantly different to the very elegant copper plate writing that we saw in the first two versions. Um, and you can probably just make out here, Nelson and Bronte, the signature. Um, but we were, at least we were able to have a look at the original of Nelson's letter. So it became very clear to us that the planters were using Nelson's letter and his posthumous reputation. Um, and remember, he had literally been elevated to godlike status uh, in aid of their cause. They sent their version of the letter to influential members of parliament. Um, I think they were aided by Prince William Henry, um, who later became known as the planter's friend, who was a very strong supporter of slavery. And our research turned up uh, uh, evidence of that particular link. Um, the campaign, the campaign was part of a much wider campaign, um, which involved violence against churchmen in, in Jamaica, plowing significant sums of money into propaganda, probably uh, paying politicians, uh, as well as trying to use Nelson's reputation to say, look, if Nelson thinks this is a good idea, it must be a good idea. So what we did then was to have a look at the... Um, letters, the versions of the letters that we had, and I've listed them here on the left-hand side with Nelson's at the top, and track some of the key changes. And I just perhaps draw your attention to uh, to a couple. The forged letters written by the planters clearly refer to the empire. They are trying to put the pressure on the politicians. Your empire is at threat. And that was a message they tried to get, get forward, where Nelson was really talking about his service to the public, not service to the empire. The other one which I find quite interesting is the fact they then ramp up the pressure, the, the just rights of the islanders becomes changed to interests. And that broadens the whole context of considerations. You've got your legal rights, but you've got much wider interests that are at stake here. You may remember I've mentioned the Reverend Scott request you know, please give my friend a job. Well, that that appeared in the very first forgery, didn't appear in anything until about 19, 1901. But look at this, Jamaica is safe, completely added to the letter. Again, Jamaica's important to Nelson. I think it, I want it saved, it's safe. You must, you must protect Jamaica's interests. So a, a detailed and forensic analysis of the letter shows us these changes and really what uh, what the planters were trying to do. Um, however, as we know, the campaign failed. The trade was abolished in 1807. But I will say that the planters were still trying to use Nelson's letter and the idea that he supported slavery right up to the debates on the abolition of slavery itself in 1834. So there was a long period in which Nelson's reputation was, was growing um, posthumously, but the planters were still trying to use it to persuade people 
uh, to vote against uh, abolition. And I think that's a that's a good a good fun great story. But what I would say is why why does it actually matter to us living in 2024? Well, we live in an age where we have now started to reassess the lives of our historical figures, especially in relation to their involvement in the slave trade. Nelson, of course, has been dragged into this debate, I believe, because he's a high profile representative of that colonial age. And but as I said, I think there's little or no evidence that he was racist or pro-slavery. However, once thrown, mud tends to stick and it's pretty hard to wash it off. Public authorities have entered into this debate because they've commissioned reassessments of commemorations of our uh, ancestors. Um, and historians who I think could have found out some of these differences um, and asked the question, why are these letters different? And they might have come to different conclusions. Um, but they never questioned or asked or asked why those differences existed. I want to give you just one classic example, and there are a number of them, but it's that of the, the Welsh Senate. In November 2020, the Senate published an audit of commemorations in Wales entitled The Slave Trade and the British Empire. Sorry, that's Prince William Henry, but that's what we're looking at. In the audit, Nelson is identified with a group of people who opposed abolition of the slave trade. Later in the audit, this is ascribed to his private correspondence, which could only be, as a source, the forged letters. And again, the provenance is given as the dark side article, which relied on a version of the forged letter. Now, of more concern is the reliance in this document on an excellent website, UCL website, which deals with the legacies of British slave ownership. It records the people who benefited from the abolition of the slave trade financially. So when the slave trade was abolished, the government compensated the planters and gave them money. And this actually records that. It's an, an, excellent, an excellent resource. Following a link referred to in the audit, you're directed to a page, and shock horror, point this out to you, where a certain someone, can you see that name there? Horatio Nelson, quite frightening. Look, he's uh, getting compensation for one slave in the sum of uh, 19 pounds, 10 shillings and 10 pence. Okay, so all my research at this point suddenly starts to collapse in me. I think, oh my goodness, Nelson did benefit from the slave trade. And then I look more carefully. Did you see the date? 1836. OK, 31 years after Nelson's death. And it's not a mistake. In the wake of Nelson's death and publicity of it, lots of children were named Horatio. Obviously, the father here, Nelson, of course, his son, Horatio Nelson. And there's quite a, a big record in, in the UCL website of these. But what I struggle with is how a public body can be relying on this information and referring you to this as part of their assessment of the life of, you know, in our case, Horatio Nelson. Um, and I think that just shows poor historical research. And I'm afraid it's unworthy of a public body. Um, so my main, I'm just going to sort of summarize and bring things together if I can. My, my main concern is that the allegations of Fewer Hirsch and Krista Petley have become the mantra of conventional wisdom. It's dead easy to repeat these things and it's very difficult to challenge them without evidence. I mean, at times it's felt as though we in the Nelson Society have been a bit of a lone voice challenging those assertions. And that's why we brought our conclusions together in our book, Nelson and the Slave Trade. That book I will say has been quite well received. Um, and its subject matter has been in the national press. Um, we had one very interesting review, um, the Naval Review, which is a uh, serves sort of the ex Navy uh, contingent. The, off, the, 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 the reviewer said, really good book, well researched, well worth reading, but I don't know why you've done it because who on earth is going to challenge Nelson's reputation? Well, we know that it's been challenged. 
And even in the last two weeks, Nelson has come up and has been dragged into broader um, political affairs. Um, so uh, in my defence, I will say we do need to get this out there because this, this is still happening and will continue to happen. But whether it helps, uh, only time will tell. Um, I'm an optimistic, um, uh, I am an optimist, sorry, um, and I like to end on an optimistic note. So while there's been a lot of talk about removing Nelson's column, you might like to know that new statues have been put up to him. This is a, a statue that's actually been erected now in Chichester. And of course, there's this in his birthplace of Burnham Thorpe. Um, I hope that's sort of given you an outline sketch of why I think Nelson is not uh, or was not racist or pro-slavery. Um, there's a lot more information. I'm not, I'm, this is not a hard sell, by the way, but there is a lot more information in the book if you're interested. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. This, this appears to be working as well. Um, I'm just going to pass over to my colleague Clive, who will uh, bring the microphone around to anyone who has questions. Um, I should add, because Chris didn't mention it, that I think you have copies of the book with you if anyone has interest in that uh, afterwards. You know, please come and see him. Um, we have our first question already. Uh, when, you, when you get the microphone, for the benefit of our listeners online, do please keep it very close to your lips so the, the audio works on the Zoom as well as in the room. Thank you. It's David Simon. Um, could you please bring up the uh, slide that shows the various versions of the letter? I hope so. That <laughs> one? Yes. But you, you've got the press letter up the top. I, yes. Oh. But is that not one of the letter, the, the versions? No, the, pre the press letter. Do you remember I was talking about uh, the early form of photocopying? Yes, yes. So Nelson kept uh, his personal letters copies of his personal letters through these pressed, this yeah. pressed approach. So the press letter is the only copy of the original that we know. It is like the photocopy of the original. Um, right. what, what's happened to the original, I don't know, but I think if I was one of the planters copying it and forging the letter, as soon as I got my forgeries out there, I think I would have destroyed the original because if that ever surfaced, it will be a problem. So my thesis is that the original has been destroyed. Okay. So the whole of the top row refers to the press. That's letter. Nelson's letter. Ah, yeah. right, because chronologically you refer to it at the end. Of the, yeah, of the that's that, that. The reason I did that was because that's yes. it, it was the last thing we discovered. Yes. <laughs> so what my question is, I mean, the Reverend Scott request. Yeah. Um, surely the, that press letter was a letter being sent to Jamaica. It was. So that's why they say Jamaica is safe. Uh, well, what if you have that's a look? That's what people in Jamaica want to know. Yeah, but Nelson didn't say in his letter that Jamaica is safe. What the planters uh, did was add, add the term Jamaica is safe because they wanted to emphasize the importance of Jamaica to the government or to the politicians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I see it flanked up there. Yeah, that's now, it. Now you've explained that that top yeah. row, did you all get that? <laughs> yeah, I think I've got a bit. I was sorry. It's there's so much material there. It's very difficult to explain it as uh, uh, logically, but hopefully that that helps. Thanks. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I you. You place quite a lot of emphasis on um, the way that this has been um, brought back up about Nelson, and of course, um, it's you know there's been a debate about about his involvement in slavery. But do you not also think it's actually a really important and interesting part of history relating to the abolition of the slave trade, and that we um, so that rather than just perhaps looking at it from that perspective, it's very important to see it as 
um, giving a better understanding of how that developed and the interests of the, of the parliamentarians, half of whom were obviously funders as well, were overcome. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the most important thing when we embarked on this, um, the article by Afua Hirsch in August 2017 was the first time in over 200 years that anybody had alleged that Nelson was racist and pro-slavery. And it was to all I was in the, as I said, in our quiet little Nelson community, that was quite a shock. Um, and we had to start to re-examine where, where the evidence for that came from and whether it was true. The purpose of our research is to try and find out, as far as one can, the truth. Now, with 220 years on, you know, and, and truth is also a matter of interpretation of the facts. Um, but what we knew about Nelson, the, the other side of his characters, his humanity and so on, seemed very much at odds with the allegations that were being were being made. So I, th I think you're right. I mean, the exploration of all these things is important and it, and it applies to all of our historic characters who are in this framework. The more we know and the more we understand, the better things must be. And, you know, I think that was our purpose behind doing the research was to try and find out what all of the, the issues are and, and, and what they meant. Um, I think the most important thing that we did was to try and put all this in the context of the time. It's very easy to think, you know, Nelson's a hero. He, his reputation takes him apart from many things. But in reality, he was in the middle of this complete maelstrom of activity, you know, the war with France, you know, the, the high politics of what was going on with the slave trade and other things, reforms at home. It was the context within which he, he was working was very confused. And then to ascribe one, you know, a, a, this set of beliefs to this person without having any regard to what that context was or why he might have said something in the way he did, I think was wrong. And therefore, I think we we tried very hard to understand that context. Does that, that help? Yeah. Um, I, I think it should, should be, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, also, it should be pointed out that the concept of slavery was not particularly well known at that time in England, but uh, three or four generations previously, people had gone out to their colonies, they'd been given reparation of a piece of land and some obviously their slaves, and their families had had um, income from that for several generations. Yeah. Something as great as 40,000 people were compensated in yeah. 1834, um, they, they, lots of people did not know where that little dividend every year came from. And they were given about nine pounds each per free slave. But they were slaves, they were servants of. Well, I think, I think, I understand, I understand what you're saying there because one of, I think I used the term. The whole whole context was highly nuanced. You had it, it wasn't just a question, forgive me, on the islands of having the white slave owners and the African slaves. We had three black uh, residents. We had white population that were not part of the slaving community, but were there serving it and serving the military interest. So it was a quite a, as I said, quite a nuanced time. It wasn't quite as straightforward or, or um, clear as we might think, you know, looking back now, it's very easy to be very judgmental about these things. But it, I think it was a, a far more mixed context than, you know, we, we even now uh, struggle to understand. Has anyone complained to the woke left wing awful Guardian newspaper, obsessed by white supremacy and always ready to trash historical figures? Uh, British figures have achieved great things in the past. It's 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 a very good question. Um, I have been urged by. A large number of people to uh, uh, 
contact the Guardian with the book. Um, I'll just give you a bit of background. I mean, the, the purpose behind the book was for us to get, you know, try and get our facts out and have something that, you know, our members were getting very concerned that they they were getting, you know, Nelson was getting attacked and there was no obvious way of coming back. So the purpose of the book was to give them some ammunition. Um, it was interesting that I was approached by a journalist just before Christmas, and it happened to be from the Daily Telegraph, uh, mm -hmm. Sunday Telegraph, who actually wrote an article about the controversy about the, the forged letters. Mm -hmm. That was sub subsequently picked up by the Express, the Times, and the Mail. Mm -hmm. um, part of my marketing campaign is to send the book to universities, mm -hmm. and particularly to those people that I know have um, been involved in this process, and then also to the other newspapers, but that hasn't happened as yet. This was this was launched at the end of October to coincide with Trafalgar weekend, mm -hmm. where I actually had my 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 biggest audience of Nelson Society members. But it, I, you know, to be honest, I I haven't. It's very difficult. Um, I'm not trying to place this politically. What we've been trying to do is to try and ascertain the facts and give a reason for what we believe went on. And I do appreciate in this sort of slightly um, contentious environment, people are going to say, oh, well, you're this side of the equation or you're that side. We are trying to stay apolitical, trying to put the facts out there. People will draw their own conclusions. They'll hear what they want to hear, frankly, if I'm being honest. But what I'd like to do is to give those people who haven't made their mind up something to think about and the, and the evidence for uh, my position. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, comments from the, uh, the Zoom chat. Um, Thank you for an interesting insight into detective work in history research. Excellent forensic analysis supporting what those of us who know and study Nelson have long understood. Such a high level of research and dedication to prove it in grid form. Thank you. Uh, and there's a couple of comments about the, uh, the Barbary pirates saying that uh, Nelson was but was pleased to see the US Navy operating against them, uh, partly on the basis that he, under certain circumstances, he was unable to. Um, so, there are more comments than questions. Unfortunately, we do have to clear the building before nine o'clock and we have staff. So, I'm going to, but we have time for a couple of last questions. If anyone wants to, so doesn't have. First of all, one comment, and that is. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I think you're very wise to stay out of contention on this and stirring things up. It would be a quick way to bring the problem down, perhaps. So I think you're very wise. But as a question, uh, listening to your reading of letters, and especially the original one, it would seem that is the crux, isn't it? It is what he says about Wilberforce. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to explain the way. It's difficult to say, oh, look what was happening in Haiti. Because Nelson makes no reference to that. So you're inferring that. So it, it is, on the face of it, quite a difficult one for you to yeah. um, explain or apologize for, which is in a way your situation. Yeah, I think the. Um... That, in, in some ways, where we started, that was one of the most troubling things, the statement about Wilberforce. Yeah. Wilberforce hypocrisy was quite easy to explain because of the, the difference in views about, you know, workers at home and workers elsewhere. Um, one, one of the problems with, forgive me, giving a talk like this is that I, I can only give you the sketch outline. In the book, we cover this issue in more detail. Now, Nelson had actually captured a couple of, or actually rescued uh, a couple of um, uh, officers from the Haitian army who had been captured by the French, and he rescued them. And he spent quite a lot of time with them. And I'm I'm absolutely sure that he was getting first-hand information of the problems they were. They wanted to fight with Nelson against the French. Um, so I think whilst I've given you that sort of sketch outline, I do I do believe that what he was saying about World War Force was probably something that he believed. He he wanted a more cautious approach to abolition because he was really worried about the dangers to the war effort with France. And let's be honest, 
you know, we, we know uh, my favorite painting, like a battle of Trafalgar. What did Nelson want to do to the French at Trafalgar? He didn't want to beat them. He wanted to annihilate them. And that was the focus of his, his, his latter career. And so I think that he would have seen something that would have threatened that as being really difficult. And I think that's why his comments about Wilberforce need to be seen in that light rather than just that his opinion versus my opinion. I think the, the picture was much bigger than was much bigger than that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It was a common criticism. Okay, we've got yeah. time for one more three questions. I think this gent oh sorry. Gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Just to go right back to the beginning, um, I agree with the sentiment of not getting into a slagging match with the audience. But did the uh, journalists uh, present any uh, substance to their comments that they were making originally? And did that, you know, have those been answered really uh, to some extent by your research? Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm conscious that we're broadcasting here. I was going to say let's keep it within this room. Um, but as as with all these things, we we challenge every statement along these lines if we don't agree with it. And clearly, statements by the Guardian were a, 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 a something that we haven't come across before. So uh, my um, two of my colleagues met with a few of Hirsch and asked her to explain her findings, where, where is your evidence? And I'm afraid it wasn't forthcoming. Um, if I can be very cynical and say that uh, three months later, a few of Hirsch had her book coming out called oh. British. Um, I, I think it was all to do with selling a book, but that's, you know, personal opinion. And uh, if I get uh, taken to court on it, there we go. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you all very much for coming tonight and um, I hope you'll have a safe journey home. <laughs>